This year's conference is part of the London Sea Power Series, a set of events deliberately designed to celebrate the maritime domain and bring together those with an interest in it in order to consider the challenges and opportunities of our time and celebrate some of our closest relationships. For instance, on Monday, we and the Royal Navy marked the 50th anniversary of signing of an agreement between the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, uh, amphibious forces, which has seen the Royal Marines and the Royal Netherlands Marines Corps train, exercise and deploy alongside each other in our oldest amphibious relationship. Tomorrow, in the grandeur of the old Royal Naval College at Greenwich, we will mark the 60th anniversary of the Polaris Sales Agreement, one of the most significant intergovernmental agreements the United Kingdom has made, in this case with our partners, the United States, laid in 1963, and which has been fundamental to the United Kingdom's ability to deliver continuous at sea deterrence since. So this is proving quite a week. But today in this conference, and as Victoria has mentioned, the sense of art of admiralty. And I would really endorse to you Professor Andrew Lambert's essay in your conference program, preferably reading it after I've finished speaking, because it underscores much of the reason and the ideas that are why we've brought you together in this format. To try and join together the public and private sector, industry, business and academia to talk about the maritime environment as holistically as we can. Now, for 500 years, the Royal Navy has stood ready to defend the United Kingdom and her interests at sea, to upholding the freedom, the right to freedom of navigation, enabling trade and supporting the economy, the lifeblood of our country. We are here to defend the nation and help it prosper. And it is a role we gladly undertake on behalf of our island community. It involves engaging with allies, making new friends, fielding the best technology making the most of every opportunity across the domain. And I look forward to much more of this. I don't know if there'll still be ships on the sea in another 500 years, but the sea will still be exist, so will still exist. And we at least will be around for much of that history. Our trade will continue to travel by sea, energy and data on the seabed. The statistics on volumes all above 90% need no repeating by me. And there are threats to our peace and prosperity, which have been discussed in great detail already. So as a Navy, we also have to be able to support our commitments to NATO in the Euro-Atlantic, to be able to deploy globally, to engage with and reassure our partners and allies, wherever they are, and to ensure that the people who share our values, like-minded around the world, can see us as reliable, dependable and engaged. In the 21st century, sea power therefore has to be from seabed to space, from sea and at sea, and a whole of nation endeavor, if we are to deter those who would increasingly seek to challenge the rules-based international order and our way of life through activity in the gray zone or conflict. So the art that Professor Lambert describes is something not of historical curiosity, but an essential necessary piece of today and the future. And it is something I think we need to regain. Regain a confidence in practicing, regain a confidence in talking about it, and regain the way in which we go about our business. And the Royal Navy cannot do it all alone by any stretch of the imagination, but as an organization with an interest in the maritime discourse, with a recognizable brand, and some deep dependencies on all others who are also engaged in this, then it is essential, I believe, that we step into the space and help catalyze and convene conversations and initiatives like the one we are having today. We will always be an island and the opportunity exists, therefore, in fact, the obligation for us to be a sea power state aligning our national interests with our investment and engagement in the maritime, creating prosperity and security, working with allies and deterring our adversaries. Now, this will not happen overnight, but I'm hugely positive about some of the things I'm seeing already. Just over a year ago, I spoke in Rosyth, where the Type 31 frigates are being built, and issued a call to arms to the industry to be not just contractors, but partners on the journey as we develop the fleet of the future. They have responded. 
Frankly, I needed them to. We now have on order or in build 16 ships and six submarines. And that just represents the major capital programs. The investments in the Royal Navy, even in the last 12 months, have been significant. Three fleets, solid support ships and a further five Type 26 have been put on order. SSN AUKUS is now in design. HMS Anson has joined the fleet. RFA Proteus and RFA Stirling Castle will very soon be in service. So the next decade is one of real change for the Royal Navy, and the investment is hugely welcome across a spread of capabilities. I recognize that some of them are deemed exquisite and have vocal detractors who advocate simply for mass, saying that we cannot afford to pursue high-end niche capabilities. Clearly, I would welcome more ships. But that cannot be at the expense of being able to undertake the most complex tasks. As we watch the increasing deployment by Russia of their most modern submarine, you would expect me to be investing in the cutting edge technology, anti-submarine capabilities that allow us to detect, find, and if necessary, defeat them. This is not cheap, but I don't see I don't see coming second in the theatre ASW battle as a desirable option. It wasn't something we contemplated in 1940s and we look to the 80th anniversary of the Battle of the Atlantic in a few weeks time. It is not something we contemplated then and I don't believe it is something we should contemplate now. But we don't need all of our platforms to be high end and exquisite. And there is a place for a ship that has a lower price tag without the same uh, without the same range of capabilities, but something that can be operated flexibly, updated with great agility and delivered in greater mass, deployed widely around the world. And this is what we are seeking in the Type 31 class. Platforms, though, are not just the answer. Such is the speed of technological change. It is likely in the future that the hull will be one of the few ship, bits of a ship that actually remains constant. And if we're to be a credible Navy for a sea power state, then we must be at the leading edge of developing and adopting new technology and innovations. This can't be done on fluffy vision statements, science projects, and a sprinkling of bare fairy dust. It must be about adapting at the speed of relevance, understanding what is available to us, taking some risk, innovating, experimenting, and then finding that technology and systems are available to us when we need them and when we don't, moving on. This week, Patrick Blackett, our experimental technology ship, is in London. She is dedicated to exactly this purpose, trialing new equipment, new ideas to help us introduce them into service more rapidly and to inform our learning as we do so. For instance, in partnership with Imperial College, She's currently testing a quantum accelerometer, a means by which we can safely navigate in a satellite denied environment, ensuring we can continue to operate even if others cannot. It matters because others are investing here heavily too. By some estimates, Chinese public investment in quantum technology in 2021 was 50% of the global total. And in the future, both our escorts and aircraft carriers will operate a mix of crude, and uncrewed aircraft. Leading the way in this field will be persistent uncrewed rotary wing systems and jet powered Banshee drones. We have a vision in the near term of deploying more highly capable, long range and long endurance surveillance and offensive strike platforms launched from aircraft carriers, recovered to them and ensuring therefore deployable agility around the world. But it's not just about the sensors. We also have to advance our ability to deliver lethal long range offensive fires. Hence the decision to ensure the Mark 41 vertical launch silo is fitted to the Type 26. And I'm delighted to say we intend to fit it also to our Type 31 frigates. This will enable potential use of a large variety of current and future anti-air, anti-surface, ballistic missile defense and strike missiles. So we're making significant investment in physical technology, but we're also working in the digital space too, because if that pace of change is rapid 
at times, particularly in AI, it is breathtaking. Everyone, friend and potential adversary alike, is stepping into this space, and it is causing us to reimagine warfare, creating dynamic new benchmarks for accuracy, efficiency, and lethality. So we are being deliberately ambitious because we have to be. The goal is enhanced lethality and survivability of de through deployment of AI-enabled capabilities. And so we must build this into the core of everything we do, particularly how we gather, process, move and store data, not just at the tip of the spear, but also in our business practices and processes. However, for all the technology and data and the potential it has to enhance and support their work, it remains our people who are the beating heart of the service. The fundamental nature of human conflict is well understood and is such that well-educated, well-trained and well-led people will still be the decisive factor in 21st century competition and war. We will continue to offer our people the opportunity to travel globally, and we will continue to give them the chance to operate the best and newest technology. They join the, the Navy to see the world, and we will do what we can to show them it, not leave them in pool. But the workforce and their expectations of employers are changing. And we have to change too. We know that many of our new entrants to the service are no longer choosing a career for life. And so we have to be agile in allowing people to enter and leave, seamless transition between regular and reserve service and out into the broader industrial place. And also recognize that some of the specialist skill sets we need will not require years of journeyman's time through the rank. So I really welcome the review of the Armed Forces Incentivization by Rick Haythorn-Thwaite due to be published soon, which I think will lay out a framework for us to envisage a really radical new workforce offering. Clearly, if you want to command an anti-aircraft destroyer, we can set the template very clearly as to the qualifications you need to, to have to command it. But if you want to be an engineer working in AI, why can't you? have something that the Second Sea Lord describes as a zigzag career, moving in and out of uniform, moving in and out of the sector with great freedom. Competition in the employment marketplace is, place is fierce, but underneath that, we must also do the best by our people we have now. And so ensuring that we are making a holistic offer to them and their families has to be the heart of any new future design for the Royal Navy. As I look at our current and future platforms and the opportunities to those who are young, serving today or soon to join, I do so with a degree of envy. As a result of investment over the last two decades, we now operate two fifth generation aircraft carriers, nuclear powered ballistic and attack submarines, a range of aircraft escorts and support ships to allow us to deploy globally, as well as fielding an elite amphibious fighting force. There are very few navies in the world who can do this. And so I am delighted that we remain in that first tier. I'm also delighted that people are still interested in what we are doing and thinking about and that so many foreign heads of Navy have come here to contribute to our debate in the same way that we seek them out and learn from what they are doing. It is why when we when the need to evacuate citizens from Sudan came about last month, it was the Royal Marines of 40 Commando our rapidly deployable early intervention force, who were the first in, supported by strategic lift from the Royal Air Force, but with HMS Lancaster soon arriving in Port Sudan days later. The decision by the Secretary of State to deploy the carrier strike group into the Indo-Asia Pacific in 2021, as has been much discussed here already, enabled us to showcase on the global stage the convening power of fifth generation deployable aircraft carriers and an international task group. We sailed half the way around the world and back, sustained through a period of difficult global COVID pandemic. And so, although it is the big deployments that make the international headlines, it is just a fraction of what we are doing. In the last year, our aircraft carriers have also trained and operated across the Euro-Atlantic, from the high north to the Mediterranean, underscoring our commitment to NATO, to our GEF partners, and to our wider allies. 
And we have plans and ideas being put forward constantly to reinforce that. It is the UK's strategic conventional deterrent capability, and we will continue to hold the aircraft carriers at very high readiness to deploy in the event of crisis, demonstrating their flexibility and agility. So the pace of change we find ourselves in, in the world today and in our Navy is rapid. We are facing an environment that is evolving faster than ever before, and the scale of the challenge ahead of us for the service feels generational. It feels like another dreadnought moment, but it will be for naught if we do not consider this as a national endeavor, reflecting the essential nature of the sea for our prosperity, our way of life, our place in the world. So as well as the change we are generating inside the service, I'm determined that we capitalize on an even more collective maritime endeavor of national and international undertaking. I recently met with the Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization at their headquarters here in London. And Kitak Lim and I talked about how we as a service can help support his intent for reinforcing leadership and engagement in the international community around UNCLOS and its importance. How we can help bring to the fore voices, not just from government, but our international partners. We are talking to university technical colleges about how we can continue to invest in the young of the country, ensuring the development of STEM skills in the next generation. Working alongside not just those who would join our service, but also the merchant marine talking to some of the city colleges about the sort of apprenticeships we offer and how we can invest in the development of the next generation. We also have a remarkable network of former Royal Navy personnel working across the maritime enterprise, from business to industry, in the shipyards, to the ports and in government. Whilst they no longer wear uniform, they help provide a network that for us enables the catalyzing conversations that we want to have. And our Maritime Domain Awareness Programme provides an understanding of activity at sea to improve security internationally, provided freely, providing freely support across the breadth of the maritime sector. These are just a few of the things that I think Art of Admiralty is about. As I've said on a number of occasions, we are not the sole guardians of the great ideas, not by any stretch of the imagination. We want to listen humbly to what others have to say. We want to learn for them and then understand where we can engage and make a difference. Because as a Navy, we have national and global reach, increasing punch, technically minded, and we are just starting to exploit the opportunities ahead. We have a wealth of people, talent and connective tissue across the maritime organizations in this country. And we have national and international friends, allies and partners who matter to us and who like we like to think we matter to them. We must make our voice heard and increase the recognition once again about the vital importance of the sea for our island nation and the global community. This is what a sea power state does. It's what I believe the United Kingdom is and should be and must be into the future. And I look forward to the part that we will play in continuing to drive it forward. Thank you.